So, uh, before beginning with the presentation, I would like to thank Professor Fatak for taking out some time uh, with us. So, I will be talking about some of the best practices for uh, documenting projects on GitHub and how to make contributions to the open source community. Uh, as most of the attendees, uh, I assume, are from the technical background, I assume that you are familiar with uh, basic uh, terminologies relating to GitHub and open source uh, initiative. But even if you are not aware of such basic terminologies, I would, uh, I will try to conduct my session uh, as simply as possible. So let's begin. So I'll be conducting my session in two parts. Uh, the part one will focus more on uh, the documentation and different ways of documentation uh, using the Git. And the second part will focus more about the open source initiative how you can look for open source projects and how you can be a part of the open source community by contributing to an uh, to a open source project so part 1 although professor fatak aptly described the importance of the documentation let's again look briefly on the importance of documentation why is it required at all I mean, when it can have such an implication that it can <laughs> uh, halt our salaries, then why is it required at all? What's the importance? So uh, for some, it's a very tedious task, right? It appears to be a very tedious task, while for others, they've acquired mastery over it over the time. So let's understand it with an example. Uh, many of you would have heard exa an example of six blind men and an elephant in several different contexts. Uh, but I would like to share this story again uh, in the context of the documentation. Okay? So the story goes like this, that there were six uh, friends uh, in a village and they were all blind. Uh, they were told that there is something called elephant coming in their village. Now they were curious and keen to know that, uh, keen to explore uh, what an elephant is. So they all went to see the elephant and they all started exploring it. So they, they were six of them and you, you and I know uh, how an elephant look like, but they did not know. So whichever part they got hold of, they came up with their own theories. For example, the one who got hold of the tail, he said, oh, a snake is like a rope. The one who got hold of uh, the legs, he told uh, the elephant is uh, like a pillar. It's a pillar. Elephant is a pillar. The one who got hold of the trunk, he said, no, elephant is a snake. So, and then they began in their own arguments. So, coming back to our context uh, of this story, uh, there used to be a time when uh, developers, they, uh, there were a particular bunch of developers dedicated to uh, develop a particular piece of software and they knew everything about it, right? But as the time passed over the last few decades, we moved more and more towards collaborative development. We began developing softwares uh, by reusing code, by collaboration. So in the story of the elephant, the very basic thing which was missing was the elementary information about what an elephant is. So uh, which is uh, that an elephant is such and such big tall, elephant has four legs, it has one tail, one trunk, and they could not, you know, assemble those information. They were all, they were all coming up with their own theories of it. So they were not able to make sense of what an elephant is as a whole. So similarly, it applies to us when we do collaborative development of a particular software. You will not make a, a a sense of that uh, particular uh, software as a whole if you will not supply it with a particular uh, uh, optimal amount of documentation, at least the basic documentation, uh, for example, uh, the vision of your software, the contributors, the contributing guidelines, etc. So if the people don't know why your project exists, they will not use it. Uh, it's very clear. If the people can't figure out how to install your code, they will not use it. If you don't have documentation, you will miss out on a whole class of contributors. 
if people can't can't figure out how to use your code they will not reuse it you have written a piece of code and release it into the world you have done this because you think that others might find it useful however people need need to understand why your code might be useful for them before they decide to use it so documentation tells people that this project is for them so if you want people to reuse your code uh, if you want people to help build your code you need to have certain amount of documentation uh, the second point reminds me of the story of founder of linux uh, uh, kernel uh, he is uh, linus torvalds so when he was young uh, he built the linux kernel as a hobby and shared it with the world and we all know the rest right now the reason is had he not portrayed his vision of uh, developing a potential os had he not supplemented his code with necessary documents people wouldn't have contributed to it and the world would have missed whatever it got as of today so document is that important if you want to collaborate on development if you want to be productive uh, and if you want to have some productive peer reviews in order to make your code better uh, documentation is needed again uh, you want your code to be understandable by a wider audience uh, then uh, again it's a must uh, again uh, it must be a question popping up in your mind that uh, or not the question uh, you must be imagining by documentation it's a whole uh, a bigger documentation say 100 pages of documentation so i am not talking about the document a uh, very rigorous documentation uh, which is required we are discussing here about the optimal amount of documentation that is required for the users including developers and other than developers to make sense of what your project does how one can be the part of your project uh, how uh, uh, people can envision uh, your uh, thought process of your project and they can finally contribute to it so the bottom line is writing good documentation is as much important as writing good code uh, and great tests it helps others use and extend your project one more thing uh, is of um, very much importance is that when the documentation is easy to update it ensures that it it stays relevant so merely having the documentation is not sufficient having a documentation on platforms such as github which provides us with the facility to track versions to compare versions to uh, facilitate easy editing of documentation ensures that our documentation stays up to date and it stays relevant to the uh, to all the users associated with that project now that we know why is it important to document let's proceed to look at different ways to document projects on github there are two common ways to document a project on git uh, one is the readme files and the other is the wiki a readme file uh, is the first thing a visitor see on any github repository uh, you must have seen most of the times some readmes are pretty good uh, they actually uh, gives you a clear picture and a clarity uh, about the repository while some are very uh, are are the ones which have least amount of information and that is just the name of their repository in the readmes we'll see uh, the examples of some good readmes in the upcoming slides so a readme typically includes what the project does why the project is useful how users can get started with the project where users can get help with your project who maintains and contributes to the project and other such minimal information so let's see an example of a good readme let's see it live yeah so there is a lag so this is a git repository for those who are uh, viewing git for the very first time uh, this is the page of a repository uh, in github on which uh, the the repository is named bootstrap 
this is the default structure uh, that is the files and the folders of this repository and here you can see there is one file called readme readme.md right which was updated 6 days ago so uh, it's not that you make readme only once when you create the repository you need to keep updating it uh, as your project grows as the project evolves over the time and that's why see uh, this file was three years ago and the readme files was updated six days ago. It's a very important point. So this is the readme file. Uh, we will take a quick glance at it. So the first they have the logo of their uh, product, then a brief tagline, then a table of content to quickly browse you through the readme file, a quick start uh, section, a section of the status, the, a section of what's included and the structure of the bootstrap uh, library, bugs and feature requests, uh, documentation details, contribution uh, guidelines. If you want to contribute to the bootstrap library, uh, there are certain norms that bootstrap uh, has created and that which you need to follow. Uh, something about the community, section about the versioning and the creators the one who contributed or the one uh, uh, who led to the idea of uh, bootstrap and releasing it in open source. Then finally the copyright and license uh, to use. So there are uh, many such uh, good readme files that you can find on uh, GitHub. Let's proceed further with our uh, presentation. So as I said, uh, a bad example of a readme would be having uh, only the information uh, in one line that's the name of their repository in a readme file. So format of readme, though it's not a, uh, a standardized format published anywhere, but most of the users uh, use readmes in this way as we just saw they have minimally these set of sections uh, in their readmes. The first and foremost is their pro project name, then a description uh, which uh, shares the, uh, the importance of your project and what it does, then the table of content to quickly navigate especially long or detailed readmes, then installation section which focuses more on uh, the process to install your project locally. Then usage instructions on how to use your project after installation. So here uh, uh, the screenshots of project in actions can be included. Then contributing as we just saw, instructions and guidelines for the contributors. Then credits. Now this is again very much important as Professor Fatak say that uh, it may not be the case that we ourselves develop everything from scratch. We may be using some existing open source libraries. Okay, We may not be the only developer in our team. There may be some other developers who are uh, developing our code with us. So in credits, you need to give attribute uh, whichever uh, reusable code you are using. You need to link to the authors of your project. So it is also of very much importance. Lastly, the license, uh, a section for the license of your project. Now, most of the users assume that anything released in an open source is free to use and they can modify it the way they want, but it is not so. There are n number of different open source licenses uh, which are available uh, on this URL, choosealicense.com if you are not aware of them all. You can have a quick look at this website. So. Every license have their uh, own set of permissions and restrictions. So I would suggest that you read the licensing information carefully and while releasing your own project in, an, in open source and for collaborative development, you choose your license accordingly, uh, deciding on what permissions you want to provide to the contributors and what restrictions you want to impose upon. Now we'll see creating the readme file. So for some, uh, you may al uh, already be aware of about how simple it is to create readme file. Uh, so kindly bear with me for these two, three minutes. For those who don't, it is for them. 
So, there exists a readme uh, in this is a repository in my GitHub account named Java programs. I am going to delete this readme first and then we will recreate it. <coughs> okay. So, now uh, see there is no readme, it automatically gives me an option to add a readme. It says help people interested in this repository understand your project by adding a readme. All right. So, there are two ways, one is that you can directly create readme from the git interface itself and another one is uh, you can create a git repository uh, from the root directory of your uh, project uh, on your local machine. So, I will simply click on add a readme. As of now, I am not adding much of the content, but there needs to be certain uh, amount of content which must be there in the readme. This is one way. Another way is while creating a new repository, it gives us an option to initialize this repository with a readme file. So, you can simply check on that option and create this repository. Now, this is a bad example of uh, creating a readme and having only the name of the repository. So, uh, I would recommend that you add uh, certain information which is required to make sense of that repository. Since it is an example and we have a uh, shorter time limit, I am restricting it to here. Another way is again I will go to the same repository. I will delete this readme first. So, now you can see there is no readme. This is my repository. I will clone it first. Okay. So, now that I have cloned my repository, I have an existing tree and I do not have a readme file and I need to add a file to it. So, to save time I am just adding it directly. Saving it with the available file extension which is md rsd adding a little information, read me example for session on 8th June. I know it is a pretty bad content, but as of now I think my intention is to share with you how to create a readme in an existing repository. So, I will quickly add the file. So, let us see if we have got the readme file. So, yes we have got the readme file here. So, these are the two ways, uh, there may be some more, but most often these are the ways which are used to create readme files. So Let us proceed ahead with our presentation. And again when you create uh, a readme file in an existing repository uh, like I just did uh, and if you uh, put it in the root folder of your uh, project, the GitHub will automatically recognize it and, and render it on the home page of your repository. 
So, there are certain more uh, things about README that we need to know that they are extremely easy to modify both on GitHub uh, or locally. Readme file extensions, uh, some of the available extensions are .rst and .md. Uh, if you want to explore some more uh, extensions and uh, better ways to uh, organize your Readme, you can check this URL, Mastering Markdown Guide. Readme should also contain the necessary information for developers to get started, uh, to get started using and contributing to your project. The longer documentation is best suited for wikis. And now that we have come uh, onto wikis, let us understand what are wikis. So, GitHub wiki uh, is a place in your repository to share long form of content about your project. So, imagine you reading a readme file with a hell lot of content, say more than 20 pages of content. So, you will be, uh, it will be very difficult for you to read uh, the entire readme with uh, 100 pages and make sense of the uh, and summarize and get the gist of the project. So, for that purpose, if you have, uh, if you want to share in depth information about your project, about its architecture, about its release history, etc., etc., uh, GitHub facilitates us with a wiki. So, every GitHub repository uh, comes equipped with a section for hosting documentation that is called a wiki. You can see in this image over here, we will also see it live. Wikis again can be edited directly on GitHub or with a text editor offline. Wikis are collaborative by design. Wiki pages can be written in any format supported by GitHub markup. Uh, these are some of the supported markups. For a complete list of supported markups and their dependencies, visit these, uh, visit this URL. Uh, uh, do not worry, I will be sharing these slides with you post the presentation. So, you will uh, get all the uh, URLs handy. Now, let us look at some of uh, good examples of wiki. So, this is uh, a pretty good example of a wiki. Let us look at it is readme first and then we will look at its wiki. So, this is uh, a code for an app called Android IM SI Catcher Detector. This is its readme. It is a pretty well organized readme as you can see it starts with the uh, title of their project, then a brief description, uh, pretty good uh, screenshots, then an index so that you can know where you are heading to what it does, why use it, warnings, bug tracker, support information and finally, the license. So, this is the readme, but for a more detailed documentation, in-depth documentation, we browse to the wiki. So, I just clicked on the uh, wiki tab and we are on the wiki. So, on the left hand side, this is the area where the entire content of the wiki is displayed. On the right hand side, there is a sidebar, wherein all the uh, pages of your wiki are being organized. You can organize it. By default, when you create any new page, it uh, gets added to this sidebar and gets sorted alphabetically. As you can see, they have pretty much sectioned their articles to make much sense for the visitor. For example, they have uh, classified getting started articles at one place, articles directly uh, which are related to the developers at one place, then navigating menus at one place, support at one place, important functions at one place. For example, installation instructions and when you open the installation instructions, you get to see uh, the article specific to installation instructions. So, that is how wiki is different from readme and is more useful. We will see another example. This is another a project called Lettuce. Here in their wiki on the home page, uh, they have given quick navigation menu in a tabulated form, you can see. So, there is no fixed format of a wiki. You can be creative, you can come up with your own uh, set of organization of the wiki. 
and it can uh, evolve over the time. You cannot be perfect in the very first go. You can, of course, every time uh, come up with the better version of it. So again, they have uh, organized the sidebar in uh, sections that make sense. First is the intro, then the getting started articles, advanced usage, integration and extension, internals, etc., etc. If you want to create a wiki for your project, it is not only limited to GitHub. Okay, you, there are certain other wiki tools available. One such tool is Confluence here at IIT Bombay. So I'll I would like to share an example of edX platform, which you uh, many of you must be aware of. It's a uh, massive open online courses uh, site. Okay, that shares free MOOC courses. So even they, when they share their code on Git, they use uh, Confluence as their wiki. So let's take a quick look on it. So this is the Confluence uh, wiki. On the left hand side, they have all the pages and articles. Let's see what they have in the architecture page. So you can see now, just imagine if they would have put this whole information in readme, what it could have done, <laughs> right? So it's documenting is important and placing the document at, uh, documents at the at an appropriate place is also important right so here they have pretty well organized although i personally feel that even this could be better organized but as i said it it evolves over the time so they have organized all the related document and there is a hell lot of document i can see but since it's important for the country uh, for the community members in order to contribute and be a part of this repository they have publicly shared this wiki and they have put all the documentation which is relevant to the contributors here in confluence wiki so uh, we not only have uh, github wiki if your company or your organization or uh, the team which you are part of if they are working on some other wiki platforms, even you can utilize that. So in order to create a wiki, again, it's a very simple process. Uh, just you have to click on the wiki button and uh, in order to add some more pages to the wiki, you can simply click on uh, the new page on the upper right hand. For example, uh, <coughs> this is a repository in video quiz overlay X block. This is also related to edX. So when I clicked on wiki, there is no wiki as of now, as you can see, I'll simply click on the create the first page button. It will give me uh, the title. Uh, it will uh, uh, give me an option to add the title. Here I can add text to the wiki, any edit message so that when the other collaborators uh, wants to revisit what all changes did I do to my wiki, he can make sense of. So even this is important. Every little thing that we write as part of the document is important. Even the commit messages that we write. If we simply, for example, if I'm a fixing a bug and I'm not detailing it, what fix did I do? I will, if I am only writing in the commit message, bug fixed. Now what the other user will make sense of it? No. So every little thing that you document is important. Every, every single line of words that you write as part of a project documentation is important. Then I'll click on save page and we have a wiki. It's a miracle. <laughs> Here on the right hand, we have a sidebar. In order to add a new page, just click on the new page button. Again, we have a very good uh, editor so that we can format our text. So 
So, here you can see I have added another page which is named intro. So, we just saw how to create uh, wikis, but there is something more to it. For example, uh, from your point of view uh, for all the interns and even for all the software professionals, there is something called GitHub pages that we will just uh, under try to have an introduction of it by watching a video of three and a half minutes. If you want to scale your documentation and if you want to represent it to the members outside the community of the contributors, then you can uh, host it on a particular URL uh, free of cost provided by GitHub as GitHub pages. You can showcase your project in form of uh, portfolio or documentation site. Okay. We will look at the example. Uh, first, we will see the video, introductory video of GitHub pages and try to make sense of what they are all about. Okay, so, this is the home page of the GitHub pages, pages.github.com. If you're a software developer, GitHub helps you build all sorts of great things. Things that help people, things that could land you a job, things that could change the world, and some things that might not. So how do you tell the world about all the great things you're building? Billboards, direct mail, these days, you build a website, and there are lots of options out there, but so many of these options can be excessive or overwhelming, even for someone who develops software all day. GitHub Pages lets you turn GitHub repositories into elegant websites to showcase your portfolio, your projects, their documentation, or anything else you want to share with the world. There are no databases to set up and no servers to configure. In many cases, you don't even have to know HTML. Everything just works. If you're already using GitHub, it's the most direct path to create websites for you and your projects. So, how does it work? Well, GitHub serves all of your project sites from a personal URL tied to your username or organization. GitHub looks for web content for your projects on a special branch. For sites tied to an existing repository, this branch is separate from your code. But you can also create a site for yourself or your organization by creating a repository with your GitHub Pages URL as its name and adding web content to its master branch. You can even drag and drop your files straight into your browser to upload them. Now, if you want to build something a bit more ambitious, like a blog or structured documentation, GitHub Pages gives you a streamlined publishing experience with the help of Jekyll. Jekyll is an open source tool that transforms plain text files into websites. But it also supports things like variables, templates, and drafts, which give you more control over the format and presentation of your site. Now, no matter which path you choose, GitHub Pages lets you treat your website's content with the same level of care as the source code in all of your projects. Because your website's files are part of a GitHub repository, you can maintain them using the same family of tools and workflows you already use on GitHub. You can use the GitHub flow to manage changes to your website. You can even write tests and have GitHub report the status back to you before merging those changes in. When you're ready to publish changes, just merge them in. GitHub automatically builds and deploys your site for you. This frees you up to focus on the content of your site instead of worrying about how you'll get it from your computer to everyone else's browser. Try out GitHub Pages with one of your projects today. Navigate to the Settings tab of your project and use the automatic page generator to create your first site. GitHub will populate your page with some basic content that you can customize with Markdown. If your project already has a README file, you can import its content here too. When you're finished editing, choose one of the pre-built themes and publish your site. If you need to make changes to this page, you can always rerun the automatic page generator or edit the files directly on GitHub. For now, if you browse to your site's URL, you can see it's up and running. With a few clicks, you can have something beautiful online, but this is only a fraction of what you can do. Visit pages.github.com to learn more about all the possibilities. GitHub is the place where you can build great things. GitHub Pages gives you a way to share those great things with everyone. So, as he said in the video, uh, this is just a fraction of things that you can do with GitHub Pages. So, Facebook, we all know what Facebook is, the most uh, popular social networking website. So, they have a repository named React on Facebook. Okay, this is the readme file of that Facebook 
react repository this is their wiki this is the link to their github page All right. So, here you can see there are a hell lot of things, there are docs, there are tutorials, community, blogs. So, all sorts of things that they want to uh, publish it to the world, uh, not only limited to the contributors of this uh, uh, repository, but to the rest of the world. Also, uh, I would like to stress upon an important point that when we talk about documentation, some developers assume that uh, source code doc documentation is enough, you know, to document a particular thing. When I talk about source code documentation, there are certain tools which generate automatic uh, API level documentation. For example, Java docs is one of those examples. So, uh, I would like to say that uh, when you document your source code, when you have certain doc uh, documents like Java docs, it is not sufficient in itself for uh, the contributors or for the users to make sense of your software project as a whole. Because not only the developers are the users, are the end users of your uh, uh, project, uh, there are certain other users as well, which needs to uh, have a clear picture and have to clarity, uh, have to have a clarity about your software project. So, there are the documents like architecture diagrams, functionality over overviews, readme files, detailed wikis, release reports these all supplementary documents as a whole make sense of your project, what its vision is for every user which is related to that project and who collaborates to contribute to that project. So, merely having API level documents or uh, source code document is not enough. Uh, I begin uh, with my part 2 and we will quickly go through this part 2. Part 2 is all about open source and contributing to it. So, let us first see what an open source is. Now that we know that uh, will be, uh, now that we discussed about developing projects in, an, in a collaborative environment, let us also quickly look at uh, what an open source software is. So, uh, an open source software uh, is a computer software with its source code uh, made available with a license in which the copyright holder provides the rights to study, change and distribute the software based on the licensing conditions. An open source software is uh, you know termed uh, under the open source initiative. Any open source software promotes trans transparency and collaboration. Now, uh, I am although revising this point, but it is crucial to know what license uh, should I choose in order to release my software in an open source platform and also the softwares which already exist in open source community to understand what licensing conditions, what restrictions or what permissions they provide me in order to contribute to their repository. Next, how to contribute to open source? Now that we have understood what is an open source, uh, the software, uh, let us understand how to contribute it. So, uh, it is a very common uh, understanding among most of the uh, people that contributing to an open source project is only about code, but trust me it is not so. In fact, it is often the other parts of a project that are most neglected and overlooked. So, you will do a huge favor by offering to pitch in with these type of contribution. Now, what are these type of contribution? Let us have a quick look at it. If you like planning events, uh, you can be part of uh, an open source uh, project. If you like to design, if you like to even write, if you like to help people, if you like to code and if you like to help others code, then you can be a part of an open source 
project. So it's not only limited to the software coders, it is for all who wants to be a part of uh, the open source project in these listed ways and some more. So if you like to do all these things, you can be part of an open source project by being a tester, by writing documentation, building a community of uh, people with similar interests, becoming a translator, helping with a bug triaging. Uh, what bug triaging is? Uh, bug triaging is a formal process where each bug is prioritized and based on severity uh, and its frequency of risk, uh, they are uh, chosen to achieve better balance working on the important and unimportant bugs. So these are typically, uh, bug triaging is done typically by the uh, by the team uh, of managers in an open source project. Then you can be a part of uh, an open source project by suggesting a feature, by helping with its design and you can be a part of an open source project or you can contribute to an open source project by as simply as donating a particular amount of uh, money. So it is no, not only about code. Uh, you can be part of an open source initiative by these all methods. Now, now that we have understood what is an open source project, how we can contribute to it, uh, uh, now we will have a look at choosing a project to contribute to. Now, how will there, there is an ocean of open source projects and how we can uh, actually see, okay, this is the area or this is the project I want to contribute to. So, though there are many ways, uh, we will discuss some of them. So, first and foremost uh, suggestion is that you stick to what you know. So, many well known open source repository uh, use GitHub, uh, for instance, jQuery, Ruby on Rails and Bootstrap to name a few. So, it is worth visiting the websites of open source projects you are already familiar with navigating to their contribute or get involved page and then checking whether they host their code on GitHub. Making your first contribution will be much easier if you are already familiar with the project. So stick to what you know. Secondly, searching by programming language. We will also see how we can actually do it on Git. So searching by programming language, chances are you already have some idea which programming language you would prefer to work with. So why waste time looking at projects written in languages you either do not know or are, aren't really interested in. So to see only the projects that are written in your preferred language, you can you know simply perform a search, I will just show you how. Uh, and lastly, you can see the trending repositories on Git and you can narrow down your search and decide finally on which project you want to contribute to. For example, the home page of my Git. So I simply wrote language colon python and, and I got 6046 and 561 results but then further applying some filters I can narrow down my search and I can look into the projects of my interest area. As you can see there is a, a quick search sidebar on the right hand side for other languages as well. So you can simply click on those languages and search. For the trending repositories, you just have to go to the URL github.com slash trending and you will get trending repositories in, an, in an open source. Here also again you have a filter to search the trending repositories by languages. We get to see the repositories like this. So these are the pre preliminary ways I, I would uh, say to narrow down your search. You can further apply some more filters to look and decide upon which project you want to contribute to. Next, when you have decided, okay, this is the project I want to contribute, what will be the deciding factor? You will of course read its README, license and contribute and contributing guidelines. If you do not read it, you will not uh, get to know the vision of the document, uh, uh, the guidelines in order to comply, uh, your contribution to comply uh, with it, okay. So every GitHub project is stored in its own repository which usually consists of multiple folders and files. Some files that are common across most of the projects are uh, README, License and Contributing. Okay. So you already know uh, what 
as we discussed earlier that what readme and license and contributing and dot md uh, kind of files contains so contributing dot md i will just reiterate that some larger larger projects have a file containing everything a potential contributor needs to know which may include project project specific guidelines on how to raise issues and contribute code so if you see a contributing dot md file be sure to read it carefully we'll just quickly have a glance how the contributing guidelines are being written by several open source project repositories for example this was the example we saw for the readme file of the bootstrap repository here you can see uh, there are there is a section called contributing they they have provided us with a hyperlink of contributing guidelines when we go further to the contributing guidelines here they have detailed out that in order to be uh, in order to contribute uh, be it uh, as uh, a bug or as a code what what sort of uh, instructions that you needs to follow or your contributing uh, contribution needs to comply with they have given examples so these are certain contributing guidelines that you will find mostly in every open source project and those who don't you can be a, a part of that project by raising an issue to ask and uh, ask them to come up with their own set of contributing guidelines finally now that we know what an open source is how we can be part of it and now that we have chosen our project now that we have read everything uh, read me license and contribution guidelines now how to make that contribution so there are primarily two ways first by raising an issue and another by contributing to a code so raising an issue is an area where you can feel uh, the project could be improved for example you could report a problem or bug you have encountered while using the software a feature you feel is missing or a gap in the project's documentation and again conventions for raising issues may vary between projects so it's always a good idea to check the project for any guidelines by reading their uh, readmes and contributing guidelines and in order to contribute a code you can simply raise a pull request so we'll quickly see make contributions so this is my home page for example i'm just picking up a random repository now you can see there is a section called issues right so the first thing which was raising an issue i was talking about this so if you come across that there needs to be an imp uh, improvement there is a bug you can simply go to the issue section of that repository you can click on new issue and here you can detail it out and further it will be looked upon by the uh, reviewers of the issues which are assigned for that particular project uh, which are the part of that uh, the team of that particular project and they will see whether your a uh, issue that you have raised actually makes sense and actually adds to the uh, adds value to their existing project if they approve it they will simply merge it to their code or else they will discard it the second step uh, is by contributing the code so what uh, typically you can do is the standard procedure is when you have decided okay i will contribute my code to so and so repository you can simply go and uh, first fork that repository okay to your home git account so it's a it's a little longer process i will not go into the specifics of it but i will definitely briefly summarize the steps to do it so we start by forking the uh, git repository of the project which uh, in which we want to contribute our code to we fork it then we clone it to our local machines uh, we uh, write the code that we want to contribute we commit it with a meaningful commit message okay and by uh, uh, complying to the contribution guidelines then we finally push our changes to the to our forked repository which is available in our own github account and then finally uh, when uh, we 
push the changes and after pushing the changes we raise a pull request when we raise a pull request uh, the managers or the country uh, or the team members of that particular pro project gets notification they review our uh, pull request they review our code if it actually adds value to that specific project they accept our pull request and they merge that code into the main uh, software project if not they will simply discard it or they will cite the reason why they are discarding it uh, these are some of the references uh, that i used in order to create this presentation i'll be sharing all these presentation slides with you uh, we expect all the interns to have created at least the readme file and uh, uh, at least the home page of their wikis by the time they end their uh, summer internship over here and rest was of course communicated to you by professor fatak <laughs> what all you are supposed to do uh, we will also be sharing you a uh, sharing an, an anonymous feedback form after this session so feel free to you know uh, suggest improvements uh, uh, on such talks uh, be harsh criticize it if you liked something appreciate it okay uh, you are free to do everything yeah and of course uh, if you would like that uh, to have uh, another session on uh, targeting a particular specific topic then please let us know write to us uh, you can write directly to me uh, here or you can uh, write to us at nvli.iitb at cse.iitb.ac.in so we will be glad to uh, host another session for you and if you want the session to be more kind of hands on less of presentation then even we can plan it in that way so thanks for bearing with me and our team uh, thanks for joining us thank you